how do you live day to day with your neighbor that you see? Uh, mm -hmm. Brenda, here's what the research says. According to Emory University, when I am kind to someone else who can do nothing for me, the reward centers in our brain begin to light up almost as if we have been on the receiving end of this act of kindness or modeling love. And you know what they call it? They call it the helper's high. When we think about the helper's high and we are helping humanity understand what love looks like in action, then they become open to the testimony of hope. Join the conversation and welcome to Inside Voice. Welcome friends. Have you ever met a person whose ability to see and hear you like no one ever has inspired you to want to be a better you immediately? Well, put your seatbelt on and grab your sunglasses because I've got an incredible guest who is going to be a ray of sunshine and a breath of fresh air to your perspectives on life, fulfillment, and happiness. Simon T. Bailey's purpose is to spark listeners to lead countries, companies, and communities differently. He is a prolific author and Hall of Fame keynote speaker that has worked with Signet Jewelers, Salesforce, T-Mobile, Stanford Healthcare, General Mills, and Hilton Hotels, just to name a few. An experience with Simon goes way beyond feel-good content. Honestly, Simon, my friend, I could read your bio for half an hour and spend the whole time of the program. So <laughs> without further ado, I want to introduce you, my friend. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Brenda, for having me. So good to be with you. Well, you are an amazing human being. I have followed you for quite some time. And what an inspiration you are to help people change their mindset and their focus. I mean, I could say that you help, you've helped me to look beyond some of the, the opposition and the negatives and the things that want to hold you back to see um, beyond those and to believe and to uh, bring into view or into focus what wants to happen. So I want to know what fueled your passion for people and for helping people. Tell me where that started. I think it probably started when I was working for Disney and in 1999, I was uh, in Paris designing a, a program for leaders out of Barclays Bank out of London on behalf of wow of their company at Disneyland Paris. And Lion oh. King had just come out, Brenda. And I said, remember who you are. You are more <laughs> than what you have become. And <laughs> oh, I love it. Something just came over me in that moment. And I said, yeah. that's it. This is what I want to wow. do for the rest of my life. So I came back to Orlando, Florida, where I live with my wife. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to be at Disney for long. And that literally began uh, the catalyst of me uh, leaving mm. Disney to do this work. Wow. Well, you just seem to be such a ball of energy and you're very consistent with your attitudes. And uh, tell us if there was ever a time that you struggled with um, identity or inferiority or, or just feeling like that you couldn't break the glass ceiling. When I was 14 years of age, growing up in Buffalo, New York, I was playing basketball across the street from the house where I lived with my parents. And a young man on the basketball court said, you are ugly. You are black as oh. tar. You are nothing. Oh. And Brenda, it was equivalent of someone taking a knife and just mm -hmm. whoosh, ripping me yeah. open. I ran home. I got the keys to my mom's car. I went into the garage, closed the door behind me, got into the car, put the key in the ignition, and I was getting ready to take my life because my self-esteem and my self-worth, uh, it was not there. And just as I prepared to turn the ignition, something said, don't do it. And wow. I got out of the car, went back in the house, never told my parents this. My mom is 81. Uh, my mom, my dad went home to be with the Lord. And uh, they still don't know to this day uh, that I did that. Uh, but that was probably one of the lowest points in my life. Oh, my goodness. And what, you know, the enemy of our souls wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And 
He just uh, roams around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But God gave you a different sound from the lion of the tribe of Judah. I mean, it sounds like God has spoken deeply to your identity and your being, your well-being and to your purpose. And, you know, there's no one like God who can speak those things into us. I think a lot of people right now, Simon, are trying to do, say all the right things. They're trying to read all the self-help books and figure out, you know, all the formulas to how do I be a better me and how do I find success? But I, is it possible that we have gotten things a little backwards? Could you speak to that for a moment? Uh, what are the secrets to truly um, finding a new trajectory yeah. So I think it's a few things. The first thing, my ethos is an old hymn that simply says, without God, I am nothing. Without God, I would fail. Without mm -hmm. God, I would be like a ship without a sail. So for, number one, everything starts with God. Uh, yeah. Having just a spiritual compass to know uh, where your strength comes from. The second thing is to be mindful of who are the relationships in your life that cause you to rise up or to stay down. Ooh. Whoever has your ear has your life. And then the, th the third thing is to really understand uh, how do we upgrade our verbal software? Language is the software of the mind. So how do we begin to speak where we're going instead of where we've been? Wow. I think you're, uh, you're hitting the nail on the head there with the narrative that we listen to. So is, you know, what about the, the, the things that we tend to focus on, uh, and be even be entertained by, do those things affect us in terms of how we think and, uh, even the, the woundings of our soul to the filter that we run everything through? Yes, we move in the direction of our focus. So our language, our speech patterns, our feelings, everything moves to how we feel about something that's happened. But when you decide to change your story, what you literally are doing is you're moving into a mental, a new mental zip code because mm. you realize that where you've been, uh, that there's something better for you. And it's a daily choice where you get up every single day and say today is going to be better than yesterday. So how I think, what I say, what I feel is all in alignment, moving me in that direction of mm. where I intend to go. That's so good. And it's an uncomfortable place, isn't it? I think uh, we, you know, people are really locked into their cognitive biases and it's, it's caused a, a lot of probably division uh, in the world. And it, would you say that it's important to remain more open? And I'm not talking about morals or, uh, you know, your belief in God or, but is it even with your, our, our faith, is it important for us to stay in an open place where God can speak to and circumstances can speak to um, those cognitive biases that are navigating us where we might be wrong. We might be um, perceiving things not based in the truth. Uh, is it important to stay open-minded? Very much so. An open person is a hopeful person. A hopeful person is a helpful mm -hmm. person. When a person is not helpful, it's because they're hopeless and they're closed. Oh. So when I really am open and I have that open-minded uh, approach, it's not about what I'm getting, it's about who yeah. I am becoming as I yeah. stay open and hopeful. Wow, I love that. Can you say that again? It's not about what I'm getting. It's about who I'm becoming. Becoming. That is really the, the that's the shift. I think we're living, you know, in such a narcissistic culture that we we go inward, we're not thinking outside of our sphere and thinking on how we can be helpful. We're not thinking about becoming what the world needs, but rather we're thinking about what can I get? And that's really kind of a, is that a survival? Uh, what's caused that? So what we're experiencing right now, to your point, is scarcity mindset versus abundant mindset. Mm. The scarcity mindset that says, in the midst of uncertainty, how do I grab and hold on to everything? I was talking with someone a few weeks ago, and they said they're taking money out of the bank right now. And I'm like, why? They said, look at what's happening in the Ukraine. I'm like, really? Yeah. 
It's because that mindset of scarcity, mm -hmm. uh, it's just like when everything happened with the pandemic, the grocery stores were cleared out, right? Because of scarcity. But individuals that operate with an abundant mindset operate from this place of when uh, an open hand is always full. Wow. When I choose to give, mm -hmm. I believe in the law of reciprocity, what goes around comes around. Mm. That is so good. And in that scarcity mindset, um, you know, I think people in order to cope with it, with the fears and the anxieties, we've culturally taken the barometer of truth and thrown it away. Uh, we have no barometer anymore in our society. And so now your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Um, is this a dangerous mindset? And, and can we get anywhere from there? I mean, what's the importance of having a barometer of truth that we all rely on? I think the barometer of truth allows us to meet on the bridge of life and say, I have enough respect for you. Yeah. to understand you and hear you, but I don't necessarily have to agree with you mm -hmm. if it does not align with my values of truth. And I don't have to throw yeah. you under the bus. I don't have to cut you down or shred you or cancel you, but mm -hmm. I can understand that I can operate in my truth that is based on a foundation, right, that I believe in, but still respectfully connect with you appropriately. Yeah, that's so good. And you're you're really speaking to the model of kindness and showing honor and respect and dignity for other human beings who may not believe the way that we do. But I think oftentimes, especially within the Christian community, um, because we're told in, in the scriptures to go ye into all of the world, making disciples out of all men, there's this kind of eagerness and zealousness that we can possibly, in my opinion, get ahead of the game and maybe prematurely try to, uh, we're trying to change people instead of letting God do the courting in that situation. Could you speak to how we could more effectively share the good news of the gospel with people? Because I think we've done it poorly, probably more often than not. And I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Well, the first thing we have to think about is your life might be the only Bible that people read. So yeah. how do you live? So, for example, you're walking into a store and there's someone coming behind you. Do you hold the door open for them? That's what Jesus would do. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps you're sitting in a restaurant and you ask the waiter, uh, who, what other tables do you have? Bring me their check. I'm going to pay for it, but don't tell them who did that. That's what Jesus wow. would do. That's kindness because you're not looking for a pat on the back or the accolades. How do you live day to day with your neighbor that you see? Uh, mm -hmm. Brenda, here's what the research says. According to Emory University, when I am kind to someone else who can do nothing for me, the reward centers in our brain begin to light up almost as if we have been on the receiving end of this act of kindness or modeling love. And you know what they call it? They call it the helper's high. When we think about the helper's high and we are helping humanity understand what love looks like in action, then they become open to the testimony of hope. Oh, man. Okay. You said a load right there. I mean, the helper's high. I, I've experienced that because my heart is that of a, I'm a cheerful giver. I love to give to people. And I love, especially like you said, to be able to give anonymously. And that doesn't always mean writing a check out to somebody or, but those, it's the littlest things, the littlest acts of kindness. And I think this is really, I think you would agree with this, how the Holy Spirit intends to operate through us. It's less about the these and the thous and the holy, uh, you know, King James language that we all want to speak when we think we're being godly, but rather those moments that you're sitting in public and you notice someone, you see them the way Jesus sees them and you, and, and he moves on you to do something. Maybe we don't know what, what kind of experience that person is having that day or, or what they're contemplating in their private thoughts. And we could be the hope givers, the one that comes along and says, I saw you. 
I, I recognized you and you are valuable. I mean, that could be something that, that changes the course of someone's life. You know, if, if someone perhaps is even maybe contemplating suicide or their, their worth, you know, I think those are extremely heavy and important assignments that were given. And so it's really not even about the, the helper's high so much as it is. And that's why we get that reward because we, we get to understanding the bigger picture I mean, people are hurting right now, Simon, and and it's. Uh, I think a lot of people would they're they're so depressed and they're so fearful that they would say, "Well, I don't want a pill of sunshine, and you know, don't try to spark me into a flame," because they're they're just jaded right now and they're heavy with the conditions of the world. And um, as we're watching all the things in the news and feeling this kind of shaking and pressure on the earth. What kind of encouragements can you give to our audience today about where we're going? I mean, is it hopeless? Is it bleak? Or is there is there a, 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 a fingerprint of hope somewhere in this mess? So, Brenda, you said something really powerful a moment ago, and I just want to double click on that uh, mm-hmm. because you've said hope almost five times in less than 30 mm-hmm. seconds. Wow. I believe where we're going is hope is your superpower. Hope, uh, Bill Johnson said a number uh, months ago, whoever has the most hope has the most influence. So how do we truly become hopeful people uh, wherever we show up? That's number one. Number two, how do we model peace in the midst of uncertainty Mm -hmm. by how we serve others? Not because of what we can get from them, but what we can give to them. So point in yeah. case, and you you said it so beautifully, if we see a person who maybe the Holy Spirit is prompting you, they don't feel appreciated or seen, smile, engage, talk yeah. to them. That might be the very thing they needed. And then the third thing is to think about how can you be a better believer, a better mm-hmm. human being, where you live right now, what is just one small thing that you can do? It might be a handwritten note that you put in the mail to someone that the Holy Spirit prompts you and they get this note and they will say, you had no idea that I needed this. What you just did, you hug them with your words. Mm. Man, that's powerful. And I'm thinking about how so many people are also hurting within the Christian community um, in ways that the last two years of a pandemic has thrust at them into even more loneliness. But they're frustrated with church systems. They're frustrated with the lack of community. It seems to be uh, the big draw, you know, like there's a, the, the churches like to project We're all about community. Everyone's welcome. Our doors are open to you. And then people integrate into the the program and and they might even serve with their time, but they feel a bit cut off. Now, listen, I understand that some of this has to do with our own personal narrative and, and how we deal with our relationship dynamics, but there's 10, there, there seems to be a disconnect everywhere and people are needing community. Can you speak to the importance of community and how we might be able to do it better in our church systems? Can you give a word of encouragement even to pastors? Because I know they're frustrated with, with the changing of times. And uh, But but where's the shepherding and, and how do we get back to that? Well, I have had the privilege of serving under a tremendous pastor, Dr. Mark Mm -hmm. Sharana, and uh, just being a member there for the last 25 years. And what I so appreciate about our community is we feed people every Saturday morning in our community. There will be uh, cars lined up down the road where we are handing out food because we want to be love in action for Mm -hmm. the least the last, the lost. So I would say to pastors right now, what are you doing to speak to the needs of the community, number one? Number two, people are in transition as it relates to their jobs, 
when they hear about artificial intelligence and automation and uh, AI and certainly uh, Alexa, people are like, oh my goodness, my job is going to be wiped out. Will yeah. I be replaced by an algorithm? How do we begin to help people in the pew reinvent their skill set? Wow so that they are relevant for where the economy is going. And then the third thing, what if every pastor would assess who's in the pew? What do they need? What's their strategic life plan? Help them to begin to think about where they want to be spiritually, educationally, mentally, emotionally, and have the subject matter experts that may be in the house begin to coach people into greater depth. You provide the spiritual food, but give them something to be relevant on Monday morning. Wow. Do you think that we've become so self-absorbed in our culture that a bit of this has seeped into the mindset of our church programs? Uh, are we trying to build a bigger, better model, but have we forgotten what the model of Christ really is? I believe that with my whole heart. Yeah. The Bible says if Jesus be lifted up, he would draw all men uh, unto him. Mm -hmm. I believe when we lift up Jesus, teach Jesus, preach Jesus, yeah. it is all about him. It is not Hollywood. It is not light. It's not even yeah. being uh, famous. It's about being yeah. Say relatable that. and available. When you yeah. are relatable and available, people will see Christ and not just you. So mm -hmm. how does the church begin to move from me back mm -hmm. to we? And, and, and the we is because of him, right? It's not us, it's him. And yeah. when we point the light back to yeah. him, they'll see, I'll tell you this real quick, my prayer yeah. every day for the work that I do, and, and my wife, we pray this, Lord, please allow the light, love, and light of Christ to come through everything we do today, period. That's it. It's not deep, Brenda, it's yeah. just simple. <laughs> Yeah, I get it. Oh, and it, but if we could just stop overcomplicating what it means to be his ambassadors and just learn to be and become and be available, I mean, how powerful would that, that would be a paradigm shift. I mean, and I believe, honestly, my friend, that we're really facing an opportunity. I mean, this is the time for us to rise up and to ignite that in one another, um, to encourage one another that, you know what, you've got this. You, it, God is the one who enables you, he completes you. Uh, you know, I've sat many times in different situations, sometimes even on an airplane, where um, I'm having a conversation with someone who I can tell had, lives a completely different lifestyle than me, has a totally different moral compass, we're just nothing alike. And early in my early years, I might have been a little more put off or fearful because of my own insecurities of engaging in conversation and maybe even from a position of judgment. And I, I really feel like the Lord is arresting us right now, if, uh, for lack of a better word. In this area, there's an alarm going off and he, he's arresting us in, in this issue of judging someone else before we really understand the, we haven't walked in their shoes. We don't know, we don't have any compassion when we're looking at um, maybe the fruit of someone's life. But can you speak to the image of God on every single human being, whether they look like us, whether they believe like us, how can we find the value in them and shift that mindset to where we can be available in an instant? Yeah. So everyone listening to us right now, Brenda, from today forward, I hope that they will begin to see every individual through God's brilliance. And, and what do I mean? Uh, what is one or two things right about that person? Just because you think of one or two characteristics that makes that person right and amazing doesn't mean that person's going to change. What will change is how you see them and how wow. you talk to them, because now you're looking at them as Christ looks at you. One of my greatest mm -hmm. failures is to judge people without really getting to know them. And I discovered, Brenda, love and respect have no yeah. color. No yeah. matter what side of the track people are from, how do we see them 
uh, because people don't see you as you are. They see you as they are. So when, wow. we, when we shift our, our paradigm, I see you through the lens of hope and how can I help? Mm, that is amazing. I love that because, you know, I, I, let's talk about even personal family relationships. We tend to judge one another, especially in our families. I mean, even Jesus' family, ah, you know, where he came from, that's just the carpenter's son. We know him. And we don't give one another that honor and the dignity that God intends for us to carry, that he gave to us. And um, I think that, you know, that is the very thing, the epiphany, if you will, that helped me to even forgive my abuser, my father, who in so many ways was such a good father, but he was split. He had been abused and all these things. And I'm not excusing the behavior, uh, but when I was a child, I was a product of uh, sexual trauma. And so it wasn't until my adult life, Simon, that I was able to come to terms with this and actually have that conversation uh, and forgiveness with my father, the verbal forgiveness. But it was the work of the Lord. And the reason I'm bringing this to this subject is, is it applies to everything. OK, mm -hmm. what you're saying applies to everything. Um, the reason that I was able to forgive and see the bigger picture. And I have such a passion for even the perpetrators of abuse because I know God loves them. And there's something the enemy has done to kill, steal and destroy on them and through them. So this is a, a, a huge, huge um, and and powerful truth that we've really got to grasp onto. Um, in this last minute, could you just encourage people who are struggling with their families, with their, you know, their, uh, their wounds and, and give us a word that can help people to bring all of this to the table, invite the Lord into it to heal so that we can move forward. Everyone listening to me right now, whatever you might be facing with your family, I would invite you to come to a place of forgiveness, really saying today, I'm going to let it go. And how you let it go is by bringing it to speech. And when you let it go, you can let it come. What will come? Peace, joy, happiness, possibility of moving forward because it no longer holds you because you're mm. being held by the creator of the universe, God himself. Mm. Amen. And the creator of the universe wants us to know him, right? I mean, it's the basis of everything, uh, but there's people who don't believe that he created the universe. And, and that's really um, a place that to me would be very hopeless. Uh, what would you say to that person who is not so sure or doesn't want to believe in a God because they, what they've seen from Christians has just put them off? Well, I want to let you know, wherever you are, you matter. You are important. And yeah. the reason you weren't born in the 18th century is because you weren't needed. You're needed now in the 21st century. And by your mere existence, you have the ability to hear, to see, and to understand everything that I'm saying to you right now. It's because you have a purpose and a destiny that awaits you. And God is just inviting you to believe that he believes in you. Amen. Well, I want to thank you, my friend. There's so much we could speak to today, and uh, perhaps we can have you back again another time. But you are a mighty warrior, and you carry such a, a deep well of hope and um, wisdom. You carry wisdom. And I thank you for the work that you're doing to really equip people to be better leaders, to be better parents, to be uh, better in at everything that they do, and just to be better at learning to love themselves and the God who created them. You're awesome. And thank you for bringing a spark into my life. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate you being on. And friends, I want to thank you. I hope that you've been sparked today to believe for more, to see the bigger picture, to understand there is a God who loves you and you are valuable. It doesn't matter where you are, or what you've been through. What matters is there's purpose 
for your life. I invite you to come again next time and be with us to hear another story that will spark your interest. I'm Brenda Crouch. Be blessed.